Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for joining today for NEO Group's Contract Renegotiations webinar. My name is Laurence Blanchet. I am the organizer for today's session, uh, stepping in on behalf of Atul Vashist. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to today's presenters, Hamith Pootley and Donald Moniz, and they will walk you through contract renegotiations framework. So over to you, Hamith. Thank you, Florence, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, wherever you've dialed in from, and thank you for uh, being here with us. Um, very briefly, the topic today is about uh, contract renegotiations, which could involve uh, anything from renewal to rebidding or, or something like that. But essentially, the focus is on what do you do when you're approaching end of term with the contract that you're engaged in with your vendor, service provider, however you refer to them. That's the subject, that's what we're going to be focusing on. And uh, I have here with me Donald, who's actually been on, on the buy side, um, as opposed to us consultants and vendors. Uh, and uh, he's going to share some of his insights and perspectives from, from the buyer side. So um, I want to quickly uh, request Donald to introduce himself. After that, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then we plunge into the subject. Donald? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, good day, everyone. So I'm going to bring the client perspective side of it. Uh, I've been involved um, in many different companies, uh, everything from the business requirements creation through the delivery. And what I've seen more and more often is the importance of the contract piece of it. So as we go through the slides, I'll, I'll be able to share with you some of my experience and my background as it re relates to the client perspective of contract renegotiation. Thank you. Thanks, Donald. Um, I've been with New York Group for about seven years now and uh, that various uh, advisory engagements in mostly in the US but also in other parts of uh, the Americas. Uh, I've been involved with a few of these contracting negotiations myself so I will bring you uh, insights into what we've observed in NEO, uh, how we've seen both the client side respond and the vendor side respond, what the challenges are and over a period of time we've uh, evolved uh, a structured and systematic way of doing this and that's essentially going to be the central theme of what we're going to be presenting today. Uh, and with that, let me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Neo Group. Uh, for those who may not be very familiar with us, uh, Neo has been in the uh, advisory and research business now for about four, 15 years, and uh, we our focus has been mostly on uh, global sourcing of. Uh, information technology and business process uh, outsourcing services. Uh, and we serve mostly clients, uh, the buy side clients in, uh, in North America. And we have done some work with uh, some agencies and institutions on the supply side as well. That's our background. Uh, for more information, you can always go up to neogroup.com and uh, look us up. So the first question I'd like to ask this audience is, what are the kind of challenges, what is in fact your biggest challenge in um, your previous experiences with uh, vendor contract renegotiations? Th these are not first time negotiations, this is what you do when, you, when the contract is, uh, needs to be renegotiated. So I'll leave you to think about that for a moment. Here are the choices that we'd like you to select. And uh, we'd like to see what uh, what kind of responses we get. All right, so that's uh, pretty interesting. We have uh, um, all change factors, evaluating all change factors. That's a very good uh, segue into some of the things that we're going to be talking about, uh, the impact of environmental change specifically. Capturing new updated terms, conditions, given that time, gathering the right stakeholders, meeting desired cost savings. Excellent. I think it's a pretty good distribution. Donald, do you want to... Yeah, you know, uh, when I look at 
when I look at this kind of uh, results, it, it kind of, if I looked at it five years ago, a lot of us would have said cost savings, but I think we've gone through that aspect of it so much now that uh, the cost savings we think we're very good at, what always becomes a challenge is the change factors, and I think the second and fourth question really drive to the point that we know there are going to be changes in a contract, we know there's terms and conditions that need to be revised, we either have a problem with evaluating all of them or we haven't we don't have enough time to get those into the contract effectively. So this is really, you know, interesting to see these kind of results, especially that seventy percent are focused on that area those two areas. Yes, excellent insights, Arnold. Thank you. Um, the next question is um, about the where the uh, focus of this uh, the renegotiations is going to be. We can move forward to yes, right. So um, we we'd like to just uh, ask the audience for um, at the, where things stand right now with you. Uh, are you are you are you have do you have contacts coming up uh, within the next twelve months, the next one or two years, or? in excess of 24 months. This is just to get a sense of the audience that we have here today and uh, uh, the situation they're in with respect to contract uh, end of term. So I'll give you a few seconds to respond to that and then we will take a look at the results. Okay, I think that should be, uh, we should have captured some results by now. So could we take a look at uh, what the responses look like, Norans. All right, so 50% is under 12 months. We're close to 40% is uh, one or two years, and we do have quite a few who are in excess of 24 months. Great, excellent. So let's uh, move on with uh, what we want to talk about. Um, so here's our perspective, and this is essentially going to be the theme that you're going to hear through, through the rest of our presentation. Um, and it ties in very well with the, with the first poll that we did, which is the changes in the environment. So our perspective is that over a period of the contract term, it could be typically three years or five years, several things. We, we live in, in interesting times as a Chinese curse or boon, uh, whichever way you look at it, uh, tells us. And uh, these interesting times see many changes. And there could be changes in the buyers industry, in the, in the global sourcing industry, uh, industry structures, regulatory changes, business strategies, corporate actions, mergers and takeovers, whatever else. It could be significant change, new locations, new vendors, new services, uh, more competition, um, and change in the pricing structures, all of that impact the way you look at the contract that you already have. So it's important to look at the uh, opportunity for uh, end of term contract renewal or rebid as a, a strategic opportunity, not just a, an operational or tactical opportunity to you know uh, just go ahead and continue doing what you were doing with the vendor because many things might have changed on both sides and need to take a fresh look. Donald, do you have some uh, comments here? Oh, absolutely. You know, and I think the, the the key aspect of the renewals that I've that I've done personally myself more often is, is not only not really waiting for the expiration to occur. That there are so many changes, regulatory, business requirements have changed. That I see more more renewals happening um, prior to the expiration date, whether it's amendments or addendums, um, and that's something that you need to factor in because it's so time consuming, especially when the business changes. As we're very business centric on the client side. We have to make sure we're responsive, and the contract terms and conditions have to modify, be modified to accommodate that much more rapidly than ever before. Right, and I think the um, next slide is going to talk about the need to be um, quick and early about, uh, okay, so he here are the uh, variety of options that present themselves, um, and on the extreme left is the do nothing option, which is um, if your contract is set for auto renew, you do nothing, it just renews on its own. Same terms and conditions, everything is the same, uh, just the term gets extended by another year or something like that. And on the extreme right is 
fairly dramatic change, which is you are putting the whole thing out for a rebid, and you don't even want to continue with the incumbent uh, service provider. And in between, you have various shades of gray, if you like, uh, wherein you um, do conduct, for example, a, a pricing benchmark, and then you sit down with the vendor and you take a look at how, how the prices might have changed and how you need to need the vendor to uh, rework the pricing, the rate cards, the, and, and the pricing a bit. There could be scope changes, uh, and you may want to factor that in. Uh, there could be changes in, uh, you know, you may want to move from staff org to managed services. We've seen a lot of our clients wanting to do this uh, over a period of time. Um, some, uh, in some cases, of course, staff augmentation is the best course for the course, but uh, usually that is a starting point for many clients to begin their journey, and uh, at some point they want to move to different models. So these are a variety of uh, um, options that are that present themselves on a what we call the continuum of uh, renewals and renegotiations. The point is to start early and think through what has changed and what uh, requires your attention uh, and accordingly decide where you want to be on that continuum. So a change analysis is essentially uh, everything points to the need to assess where you are, take stock of the situation, uh, and for that you need time because before you know it, the contract is, the, the date is uh, around the corner and then when you start thinking it's too late to organize yourself, mobilize your end of the organization uh, and get people thinking about what is the scope change and you know what are the terms need to change and that sort of stuff. So we recommend that give yourself a year approximately depending on how many contracts you have, whether you're engage with multiple vendors and when they all come up for renewal, uh, it is good to take stock of these situations about a year in advance of uh, end of term of most of your contracts or the most important ones of your con important contracts um, and, and take a look at uh, you know the, the change scenario. Donald, your thoughts on uh, starting early? Absolutely. I, I think there are a couple of perspectives that I have with, with the beginning early, the, the first thing is that uh, I used to always think that it was the client-driven side of, of being able to start the process, but what I'm seeing more and more is that the vendors are now coming back to me and saying, you know, we've recognized scoping changes, we have pricing changes, we have market conditions that we need to discuss to change from a contract that might be a year or two old. So I'm seeing the, the, the vendors actually coming back more often than not uh, on also asking for renewals, not only price increases, but sometimes efficiency issues. The second thing that I want to bring up is, you know, I, I, so many times I get into this 11th hour negotiation thinking it's, it's going to be really beneficial, where it's the end of the quarter, it's the end of the fiscal year with the vendor, um, or it's the end of the fiscal year for the client, and we, we seem to have different pricing and, and capabilities of, of spend. And many times we think the 11th hour is going to come up with results, but what we really end up doing is lack of sleep. We don't get to a, a good situation of pricing. And it's really balancing out the relationship that you have, whether it's a commodity contract or whether it's a very specialized type contract. So I always try and figure out if it's, if it's something that's very commoditized, maybe I don't have to start as early as if it was much more complicated and much more complex. So I'm always balancing that out, and I think we'll get into that a little bit more on the later slides. Right. Thanks, Donald. That, that's a good perspective from the buy side. Uh, I think we've been through this question. But, uh, no, I'm sorry. We haven't been through this one yet. So, quick poll. When do you typically begin your uh, thinking about your, your process of um, the new re negotiation? Within three months of the end date, three to nine months of the end date, or in excess of nine months? And I'd be really interested in knowing what the reality is, um, at least to the extent that it's represented by the slice of the audience that we have here today. So I'll give you a few seconds and uh, we'll take a look at the results shortly. Okay, so what do we have? Ronald, can you help us with the responses, please? Ah, good to see that. So quite a few people actually start planning well in advance and I think that's 
very consistent with what you're going to be hearing from us. That's uh, it's always a good practice to start well in advance. Uh, at least nine months is what we are saying. So actually, this should have been more, but we just thought we will get a sense of what it, what it is like with the, the audience here. So starting early, that's good. We've talked about it. Let's now talk about what it is that we're going to do when we start early. Right? So we have, Neo Group has a uh, three-stage framework, and the summary of that is right, right here on this slide. Stage one is discovery, stage two is impact analysis, and stage three is execution. Very simple words, nothing very complex, no rocket science here. So in stage one, and I'll walk you through each of these stages, uh, in stage one, you would go through an assessment of changes, and this is, again, back to the first poll we did before we even started, which is a lot of people said that the, the, there were a lot of triggers which came in from the environment. Uh, so change assessment, um, what is the kind of change and, and the quantum of change that is making you think about these things. Benchmarking, uh, significant um, impact that it could have on knowing where you stand with regard to what the vendor is charging you under the current circumstances of the industry. And new models, again, uh, there could be a lot of innovation that has happened among the vendor community in terms of how to engage. So th these are the three of the typical uh, areas where we investigate uh, you know, what could have changed in the vendor environment. And then we move to uh, Stage two, which is impact analysis. So based on our assessment of the changes, we look at what uh, what impact that has on where you are today, uh, and look at the gaps in your in your model in your operational model today, uh, areas where the contract is not going to sustain you going into the future. Uh, you know, with the kind of changes that have happened, etc. So we we look at the impact of those changes, and we envision a few scenarios and uh, issues and potential uh, opportunities and we develop recommendations in terms of what your strategy should be to going forward and stage three is essentially execution of that strategy we picked two examples here which are very typical and we found this happening in most of the cases that we've uh, end contract renewals end of term situations one is the benchmark and the negotiate strategy uh, with the incumbents, and we did this recently for a financial institution in uh, Chicago, where there were four incumbent vendors, and we went and did a benchmark in the marketplace. And we have a research group, like uh, I've shared earlier, and the research group uh, did um, a pricing exercise and came back with uh, what the current rate cards should look like for anybody engaging today. And then we went back and renegotiated the pricing with, uh, with the four incumbents. One of the, the challenges in this process was to standardize the roles uh, themselves because different vendors have different names for the roles. And over a period of time, uh, you know, everybody wants to differentiate and it gets um, a little confusing. But I won't go into too much detail right now about that because we I think a little short of time. Uh, the other um, execution possibility, the other strategy that you may come up with is um, define your requirements today. This is when you have a lot of scope change. The benchmark and renegotiate is when you, the scope is more or less the same, but uh, there are reasons why the pricing, you know, reasons to believe that the pricing could have changed substantially uh, in the last few years. So that's the, um, that's when you do that. And, Second option is what you, you would do when your scope has changed significantly and you need to look at uh, new vendors maybe uh, in the industry because of that kind of a dramatic change in scope, uh, you know, there are new things to do and maybe there are other vendors who are better suited to do those things than the income incumbents that you have with you. So you can, this typically you shortlist from the industry and uh, define your requirements and discuss with with vendors and uh, collaborate on solutioning, down select, negotiate, and finalize. So that's typically how that would uh, turn out. 
it's time for a quick poll again and uh, let's find out when you do price nego renegotiations uh, where do you uh, pitch yourself uh, let's say you have an industry benchmark or let, let's say you don't in fact that is the first question do you go for uh, benchmarking or don't you and uh, what are your sources for benchmarking and yeah, depending on what, what kind of pricing benchmarks you've got do you where do you finally want to settle uh, exactly at the benchmark or do you want to give your vendors a little more freedom uh, because your requirements are a little different unique maybe and go a little uh, above the benchmark or be even more aggressive and try and price yourself uh, below the benchmark so I'll give you a minute to think about that um, and mind you what we're interested in is what where do you want the outcome to finally arrive at it's not what your initial ask is all right so let's take a look at what the responses show us hmm not many people use benchmarking and those who do seem to prefer to come in exactly there not above not below that's pretty interesting well you know sometimes and the, I, I was gonna say ahead, sometimes Paul. you know one of the challenges you know from the client side is you know, when you look at the three stages, you know, it, it's having that, that, that process in place that's really important. The, the challenge that I always see is on benchmarking is being able to use the right, the right benchmarking and being able to have the right information so that the, the benchmarking value is correct. Many times I say, you know, if, I, if I'm at $100, I want to go to $90, but I really don't know if even $90 is the right number. And it's, it's very complicated sometimes to, to figure out the right benchmarking metrics that we're using in the industry, in the type of services that I'm looking to uh, to, to have recontract, a renegotiation going on. Right. Thank you, Donald. That's good insight. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit uh, in more detail about uh, how to assess the change in stage one in the, in the discovery process. So what you have in front of you is uh, four quadrants of our change grid. Uh, on the left you have the demand side of the industry, on the right the supply side, and above the horizontal line you have the, uh, the environmental forces that prevail on the customer's um, business, the enterprise, or the, the global sourcing industry on the supply side, and below the line you have the the actual organizations that are engaged in the contract, which is typically for an IT contract, it would be the CIO organization, and it would be the, the particular um, vertical or horizontal or delivery management organization in the vendor's organization that is engaged with the CIO's uh, staff. So these are the four, four uh, domains, if you like, where changes could have happened, and there could be different kinds of changes which we will see in, in the next slide. Um, what might have changed uh, in, the, in the customer's um, industry overall, what might have changed in the vendor's industry, that's top left and top right respectively, what might have changed in the, in the IT shop uh, of, of the customer, and what might have changed in the vendor organization with regard to uh, the team that is delivering services to the uh, CIO organization. Donald, I'm sure you've gone through at least uh, most of uh, what is on the left-hand side yourself, and you might, must have seen what's happening on the right-hand side with your vendors. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think what, I, what I've always gone through with this kind of a listing, um, and you can add a lot more to it. There's a lot more individual items that could be added. It's looking at the importance of these and the impact is, is not only on what, what what I would be looking from a client perspective, but also what's happening in the industry in terms of how it's going to impact me. If there are changes like on the right side of a delivery location, if you want to go to a new location, each of those will have an impact. So this type of, these drivers, I always look for what is the importance and what is the impact to my operation. And that's kind of my, my jump into a contract negotiation. Absolutely. And uh, I, what, what you just said, the emergence of new players, the emergence of new delivery locations, uh, and the new engagement models, they represent a lot of opportunities for the customer organizations, which, quite frankly, if you don't, um, you know, take a look at and examine and evaluate these 
and and relate them to yourselves, uh, you may just uh, miss miss the opportunity altogether if you're too internally focused and only thinking of you know uh, what uh, is happening within your organization and not so much what's happening within the sourcing industry. Uh, you might miss those opportunities, and they are really great opportunities. They can help you get a lot of value and save a lot of costs, both. So that is um, something that is uh, very critical uh, for um, the buy side organization to focus on. Uh, and while on that subject, I think a, a little more detail in the next slide about uh, maturity and what uh, our framework to look at maturity on the supply side. And let's start with uh, service capability on the top left, which is uh, these are the the, the criteria that uh, uh, we look for uh, in, in what has um, changed and improved uh, on, on the sell side with the incumbents or with other pay, uh, participants. The breadth and the depth of the service, how, how they're delivered and how they're managed and how quality is assured. Uh, on an ongoing basis, the suppliers are growing more mature in terms of leadership. Uh, and, how, and the management capability, the management depth, and uh, aligning uh, management with the technology uh, and uh, innovation and, and client needs. There could be evolutionary and innovative changes happening in the way vendors are organizing themselves within the within uh, their, their organization, and especially at um, larger uh, organizations in higher tiers. Managing such large organizations becomes quite unwieldy. So it's interesting to see how they they orient themselves, reorient themselves to the market, and how they clarify the, the vision and strategy and build capability and uh, capacity. Uh, other parameters include developing the technology edge, um, managing the customer account, and managing their own people. And many vendors have started fo focusing a lot on their employees uh, without naming a few. I, I think some of these slogans you might, you might be familiar with, where, where vendors actually put employees first um, over and above everything else. Uh, but that again is a reflection, regardless of whether you agree with that or not, it's a reflection of how important um, HRM and human resource management has become uh, in today's time with regard to achieving a certain level of maturity at the, on the supply side. Donald, you must have seen a lot of your vendors also going through this uh, curve, if you like, and evolving oh, towards maturity. You know, and I think that what, I, what I've used this for is, is when I go through my vendor classification, where I look at my strategic vendors through my commodity vendors, it's important to try and figure out where they fall within this category. It could be monthly meetings that you have with the vendors, or it could be dashboards that are created. The challenge that I've always faced is being able to validate my findings. That is it unique to, to my situation with that vendor, or is that a continuing uh, issue or concern or benefit of that vendor with, with all the other clients that a vendor might be working with? And you know, the, 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 when I hear things like you know, vendor, uh, where a vendor would say that it's employee first, their employee first, um, I have to think about how does that impact me? And where on this, this listing does it have impact to my operation? So I, again, I go back and I look at this and how do I validate it? And that's where I've, I've tend to use uh, advisory firms to be able to validate what my findings are so it's so I know it's not unique to me or unique to my sales team. Great, thank you, uh, and thank you for opening that uh, opportunity for advisory firms like us, <laughs> where we can um, hopefully work with you and buyers and uh, provide uh, our insights, uh, our recommendations, and and help you improve. So this is uh, stage. Uh, the stage where you look at the changes and how they impact, how those changes impact you uh, is what you then examine in uh, the impact analysis. You look at where you are today with your existing contract, where you are today with regard to all the changes that have happened since when you signed that contract and where you're going to go in the future. And so these are the three dimensions, if you like, um, which sort of constitute the impact analysis. And I would uh, liken this to a, either a, a car that is kind of going off track because it lacks wheel alignment, 
or a shopping cart, and I'm sure you all you are familiar with this experience. Or in an airport, or in a, in a, uh, when you go shopping, if you have a cart that has wheels that kind of it tends to uh, deviate from the straight uh, path, you always have to keep correcting the course of of that particular cart as you push it along. So this is somewhat like that. Uh, the contract that you've signed is going in a certain direction, but the changes that have happened are going in another direction that obviously leads to gaps. And those gaps could be at any level. Uh, we talked about pricing, we talked about benchmarking, we talked about uh, engagement models, um, operating models, uh, legal, regulatory, and of course, the most important gap, which is alignment with business objectives. So that's what we do in this stage. Donald, uh, you, you must have observed that uh, when you come up for the contracts come up for renewal, there are significant uh, gaps between what you started out with five years ago and where things are now. Oh, absolutely. I think it's you know trying to you know, have that crystal ball to figure out what the changes are, and knowing that an agreement is a living document. I think we've all fallen into the trap where we think we could uh, do a contract, put it in the drawer, and then and you know just not worry about it till the renewal comes up. And those days are long gone. Um, even when you just look at the regulatory changes that occur so often, as well as just the economics of, of the different countries, you know, currency adjustments and so on, how do we accommodate for that in a contract? So the, the, it's up to us as, as client-side people to make sure that we, we address and we predict as best we can all the changes that will be occurring. Thanks, Arnold. The next slide. Um, we're fond of quadrants here. We're, we're consultants and we love quadrants. So <laughs> I'm going to throw more quadrants at you. So on the x-axis, we have uh, the cost of service delivery. On the left side is high, on the right side is low. On the y-axis going down, we have the value delivered to business, which is high up and low down. To the top left quadrant is the high cost, high value services. Uh, the bottom right is the low-cost, low-value service. It's the exact opposite of it. And the other two variants are on the top right and the bottom left, if you like. And the recommended strategy in each of these quadrants is written inside the quadrant, which is that for uh, if the service delivers a lot of value to the business, but it costs a lot of money or as well, then you need to look at how to re-engineer to reduce those costs. And the diametric opposite is if the service is not adding enough value, and but not costing much either, then you need to look at whether there's an opportunity to innovate and get the service to add more value, uh, and whether you want to then keep it or get rid of it, which is the other two boxes there, which is if the cost is high and the value is low, clearly there's no reason for, that, for you to be um, engaging in that service anymore. You can sunset it, retire it, and get rid of it. If the cost is low, and the value is high, that's really where we want to be. Uh, and that's the uh, service that you want to retain as is. You do not want to upset the Apple cart there. Uh, you're getting the you know, cheaper, faster, and better stuff already. And that's where you want to be. So typically, when we do an analysis, we find that different services are sprinkled across these quadrants. Service one may be uh, something that is low cost, high value. Service two may be high cost, high value. Service three may be low cost, low value. And service four may be high cost, low value. So accordingly, we uh, have tools to, uh, to measure and, um, and to arrive at uh, where these uh, services fit in. And uh, the next slide will actually take you through, give you a little bit of a background on Obviously, we can't go into too much detail here because of, of time constraints. But the, the components of the of the service of any given service uh, that drive costs are these objectives, the structure, the way that the service is structured, the processes that happen inside the service, the scope uh, that is the capabilities required, and the scale that is the capacity required. And each of them drives certain uh, costs in, in in the stack of uh, the financial stack, if you like, or the uh, service level stack, which again drives costs. So you, you marry the objectives with the metrics and the customer satisfaction to see if those objectives are being met. Uh, 
you look at uh, the structure of the service delivery organization to see if there is management overhead that and whether it's adding value or adding cost uh, back to what we said in the previous slide you look at the processes being followed look at the methods and tools look at uh, the possibility of any automation that can make it faster and cheaper and then you look at the scope which is the the roles and the way the uh, delivery team pyramid looks uh, you know, how that is structured whether you have the right people at the right points in the in that organization and lastly, whether you have the right number of FTEs on the job. Your comments, Donald. Well, I was the point I was going to make was the last two things you added. I mean, the the, the whole process that you go through and, and that is is critical, and I think it's directed towards: Are we looking at a resource-based pricing or is it a service-based pricing? And 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 it gets much more complicated with service-based pricing. But I think it's important to have this kind of a structure. And and many of us on the phone have gone through this process and really have dictated to the vendor, here's the process we're going to follow. And it makes a big difference to have these things kind of laid out. And it's the game plan. And for those that haven't used this structure before with a vendor, you know, it's a great way of being able to get a vendor to see the right process to engage with you. And if they can't follow these processes, you really need to question whether it's the right vendor for you uh, to be able to deliver in the right way. So I always like these kind of uh, displays as a good way of, of preparing for the negotiation. Right. Thank you, Donald. Uh, this has been distilled out of many uh, experiences, so hopefully it represents kind of an, at least at an abstract level, uh, you know, as kind of a straw model of how we need to proceed uh, in these situations. So um, I would now invite Donald to share uh, some of his perspectives, insights, and experiences from the customer end. Take it away, Donald. Thank you very much. So many of you know me, and I'm very passionate about the relationship aspect of, of what we do with our vendors, whether it's onshore, nearshore, or offshore. And I think when we look at the whole negotiation process, what I always kind of step back and look at is, is how do I get to that handshake? Um, and I'll talk about win-win in a second, but how do we get to the handshake? And there's really four objectives that I always look for before I get into my negotiations. And this goes back to if we can plan early, then we can do a better job of it. Uh, depending on where we are. I mean, we're very busy, um, but doing the best you can to really know the objectives, to have enough time, to make sure that you know who the decision makers are. And I think that's a big in impact where the decision makers sometimes say, you know, get me the final contract and then I'll review it or reject it. And sometimes that works, but many times it doesn't work. And what I always talk about is getting the decision makers in the room, and it can be a virtual room, but getting the right decision makers in the room on the client side but more importantly, on the vendor side. I've been through too many negotiations where I've asked for things and the phone call has to be made and it's, you know, phone a friend or, or call a lifeline, but the reality is make sure up front that you know who those people are and it's a good question to ask our vendors. And finally, the goals. Knowing what the goals are for the client, but also knowing what the goals are for the vendor. And I think when we go through our negotiations sometimes, we, we think that it's the sales, uh, they just need to get revenue for the year, or they want us as a marquee client, but knowing what their objectives are, are important. If it's a new service line that the vendors want to offer us is one thing. If it's not their core competency, know that go in there. So it's really important to understand these four aspects going in there as well. Next slide. Yes, totally. Sorry. Uh, yes. I think, I'm sorry, Ron. The, I, I think the, the, that point that you made just now with the uh, knowing the vendor's goals, that's extremely important because these are partnerships. Uh, these are not situations but the master-slave kind of uh, relationship. These are uh, partnerships between peer organizations. It's important for there to be goal congruence between the buyer and the seller for a more sustainable and longer term and healthier relationship where everybody is successful. Thank you. The, the next slide is kind of, is a, is a, we've seen this before in terms of what our objectives are. So these are just some more objectives to look for. Um, I do want to go to the last bullet point about the, the sourcing strategy with multi-sourcing or multi-vendor. And those tend to be the most complicated that I've seen in terms of negotiations because we want to make sure that the service level agreements are, are solid between the vendors that deliver to the client. And, and that becomes a really important aspect of it. So if you single source, it's, it's, it's easier. But if we multi-source, which many of us do, 
it's it's making sure more of the details are there because you want you don't want blame game. You want to make sure that everyone understands how they're part of that that relay and part of that cycle. And that's why it's so important to understand the objectives, understand the vendors that are in the mix, and making sure that you have your game plan ready to go. Great. So we have another uh, another quick poll. Um, other than cost savings, what is the most common reason to consider renegotiation as opposed to order renewal? Give it another couple seconds here and we'll see what the results look like. So accommodating scope change, resolving performance, um, implementing new sourcing strategies, zero, and nagging feeling, and, and that's my favorite, the nagging feeling that things could be better. Um, you know, I always look at when I go through my contracts, what did I forget? And, 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 I, and I'm, I'm not selling using consultants all the time, but I will say that the times that I looked at consultants to help me with, you know, there's something not right, I just can't figure out what it is. Um, and sometimes there is low savings to it or low opportunities, other times it's high, but you know, having that nagging feeling is so important. I mean, resolving performance and, and schedule issues is, you know, my favorite thing about performance penalties and performance incentives. Uh, and just understanding the scope is so important. Any other comments on that? Great. Um, so, you know, the, the next piece of it, uh, and then some of you may have heard about BATNA, which is the best alternative. You know, when I look at the contracts, and it might sound like a very cliche thing to say, but you know, I do want a win-win. If it's, even if it's a commodity service, we want to make sure that the vendor sees value in the relationship as well as what the client sees. And I'll tell you, most of the contracts that have been terminated or failed, it's because it wasn't a win-win or it wasn't a little win, little win. It was a win-lose. And the vendor at some point feels that they need to get out of it or they're not going to give you the A players. And for those that have done a lot of offshoring, you know, we're, you know, for the U.S. to offshore to India or China, we're very far away and it's hard for us to make sure we've gotten that solid team. But by getting a contract really speaks to the benefits is really important. And that's what the win-win really talks about. Uh, and, I, and I do advocate that. I know when you talk to the lawyers in the room, um, you know, they look for the best contract for the client, but I think many of them are coming around to looking for what's the best process from a, a client and, and partnership perspective. The second thing that um, I've talked about a lot in the past and, and, and people need to have that when they go in is, is BATNA, which stands for Best Alternative to a Negotiated Agreement. We all have to negotiate in life. We all have to negotiate in our contracts. And when I go to my objectives, and let's say a metric, I want to have, if you look at the call center, I want a three-second average speed to answer as, as a very basic factor. What am I willing to compromise? Because it's going to drive your costs. And going in with each of your requirements and what is your alternative, doesn't mean you have to do it, but what are your internal alternative? Because the vendors will always have that. And it's very important when you go into their contracts that I've used this successfully, is what am I willing to compromise on? And, and I think the issue gets into my must-haves versus my nice-to-haves, and knowing that is very important. Additional comments? No, I think that's the um, essence of any negotiation requires that you have a backup plan uh, and what is going to, what you're going to do if, you know, this doesn't work. Uh, so uh, I didn't know it was called BATNA myself, but that's, that's a nice uh, acronym there. Uh, but yes, I mean, we, ideally, in an ideal world, we want a win-win, but everything is about give and take, and self-interest is really what, uh, at the end of the day, you know, is, is the value to uphold, and which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's what we, we want to do. So knowing where, what are the things that you're ready to give a little bit off in return for something else, and knowing where the trade-offs are is really the key to a successful negotiation. Without that, you're entering a negotiation that you really don't know whether it's going to work out for you or not. Absolutely. And, and that's why it's so important to have benchmarks because, like we talked about earlier, if you know where you want to be based on the benchmarks, that's part of the negotiation where you may not be, you know, 10% below what a benchmark would be for price or 20% or, or above for delivery, but that's what you have to know going in. And that makes it, that's why benchmarking becomes such an important aspect. And also, benchmarking doesn't have to be just metrics, it could be process. You know, whether it's ITIL or CMMI, that's something that we put into benchmarking as well. Uh, and I've used that very successfully in the past. The, uh, the next couple slides um, really gets into 
and I'd hate to say the word the game within the game, but knowing your audience is important. You know, if you're, if you're a comedian, you always want to know your audience. You want to know what makes them laugh, what makes them cry, you know, that type of thing. So when I go into contract negotiations, I kind of look at the players and, and I look at what their intentions are, what their culture is, what their expectations are, because that plays so much into how I, how I plan for my renegotiation. And these are just some factors where if you look at a goal, some people, all they care about is, is a contract. They want the contract terms and conditions, and they want the best terms and conditions. And they negotiate to get the best terms and conditions. While others, other groups may look for relationships, where, as I mentioned before, you know, if you want a marquee client or if you want to be able to develop a new relationship for a new service line, you know, that's an important goal. The attitudes, the personal styles, the way that we communicate uh, is all going to be important as we go through the communications during, uh, during contract negotiations. As we all know, some people like being very direct. Uh, I'm from New York. I tend to be very direct. Other groups, other cultures uh, might be more indirect. So again, these are just kind of laying out the game plan as you get prepared for your negotiation. And I think we've all used this um, kind of informally, but what I like to do is I find things and I say, here's my list, and I use it as part of my playbook. The, the final slide, I think many of you have probably seen versions of this, and I think there's another, there's another type of slide like this. But what, what I take is when I look at the culture, and I do a lot of negotiations for different countries uh, and different groups that, so if I'm, if I'm on the bottom left corner of this, for example, you'll see USA, Norway, Germany, Switzerland, and Luxembourg, and then the UK in a different slide of color. What this kind of represents is the culture of, in terms of the way we operate together. So in terms of how we communicate, how we plan, how we make decisions are, cl are kind of clustered together. It makes it easier to negotiate. I mean, it doesn't make, make the contract you know, done quickly, but it makes it easy to negotiate when you're doing with similar cultural groups. I do a lot of in, in, um, cult contracts with India, and you can see that the U.S. is on the far left and India is on the far right doesn't mean we can come to terms. I've done a lot of contracts with, with Indian companies, but the point is I need to understand where the cultural differences are so that I could, I could prepare my contract negotiation in that proper way. And you can see that if on the far right, you know, you have emotional, you have, you know, impulsive, and then you have other groups that are, are different. This is just a good way of looking at who the players are, which countries you're going to be dealing with, and build your strategy to do your contract renegotiation based on these cultural matches. And as I said, it's not that we can't work, it's just that we need to change the way we operate and the way we negotiate. And for those on the phone that have done contracts with Japan, there's a very strong hierarchical process that we have to follow when we do contracts with Japan. That's what this looks at. And that's how I use this chart. And again, I put this as part of my playbook and all the members of my team will be familiar with this. And that's really important as we go through it. Thank you. All right, I think, uh, Donald, thank you for sharing uh, your customers' uh, perspective on the buy side. Um, we'll now uh, open it up to questions. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, and on behalf of Atul, uh, Donald, and, and the entire NEO team, we, we would be happy to take these conversations forward even after we end, which is, I think, in another five or ten minutes. Uh, but before that, let me uh, throw it open to you for questions uh, and try and take as many of them as we can in the time that we have. So, so I see a question about um, it's difficult to get everyone excited about it, anything 12 months ahead of time. Who within the client organization should be taking ownership of this? Um, and mobilizing the rest of the organization. You know, from my perspective, I would love to be able to get people excited about a contract 12 months out, uh, but it all depends on the type of work that we have. So I, what I normally have done uh, from the client perspective is I get the business unit to understand where the changes are. And where I've been able to get people excited about it, if there's new opportunities to do a renegotiation in 12 months, and that if we do this in a, in a, in a in a formal sense and define requirements, you know, people get more excited about it. It's tough though because we're so busy to get them excited about something 12 months in advance. But what I try to do is if a contract expires in 12 months and I see opportunities today, I might renegotiate earlier or I'll plan out a strategy for let's say every three months, renegotiate new terms 
or we plan to implement benchmarks. So this, the last part is that when I, when I have long-term contracts, I try and use benchmarks to get me where I want to be and keep the client side engaged. Yes, I think if I can add to that, um, Donald, yeah, I think the it, it's very important to know how to mobilize uh, yourself. When we, we talk about the benefits of starting well in advance, but the tendency of a lot of people is that ah, we have enough time. We'll, 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 uh, more. It's always the <laughs> conflict between the urgent and the important, uh, and this is important stuff. But other urgent things always take uh, precedence, and it's. Uh, the challenge then becomes how do we get everybody thinking about uh, what we're going to do with the contract that is uh, the renewal of which is going to be a year from now. So yes, that is that is an important question. I think we need to focus on how, how to work that through. Yeah, and actually, while I'm waiting for more questions, I had a question for you. So when we go through all these different models and, and, and stages, I, I think the one thing that I had, I, we spoke about yesterday was, is this universal for all industries, for all service types, or how does it get modified if I'm doing, um, you know, a commodity for media and for infrastructure support versus something else? How do I change these models to, to accommodate that? I think that's an excellent question, uh, Donald, and um, I, I'm sure it's on the minds of a lot of people as well. Um, what the frameworks that we evolve over a period of time, they they abstract the um, essence of what we have done in different situations and boil it down to something that is extensible and applicable to other other clients. Uh, that, that is how we work. That's how any consulting firm works. But um, we have to be careful to not generalize industry-specific things uh, across industry uh, differences, for example. Uh, what happens in uh, a bank may be different from what happens um, in a process manufacturing co company, are bound to be uh, differences. So um, what we have here by way of a framework, the three stages, that is fairly generic, it applies across all industries. You've got to look at what has changed, you've got to look at what it means to you, and you've got to look at uh, the, the two or three or four possible alternatives in terms of how to manage uh, that going forward. That much is common, and uh, a lot of it actually, if you step back, is, is actually common sense as well. Uh, but we've, we've got tools and, and methods underlying all these questions, how to go about the discovery process, how to capture what has changed, how to uh, analyze the impact of what has changed on what you're doing and where your contract is today. And then, based on that analysis, what does that point to as the way forward? Do you need to just uh, auto renew, just let it go forward? Or, uh, so there are questions that we ask in these uh, uh, methodologies, which are again not industry specific, but they focus more on the change and the impact, which is really generic and constant and applicable across all industries, various sizes of the organization, and so on and so forth. The scope and scale, of course, is different, and the, and the answers to some of those questions may be very industry specific. The questions themselves are fairly generic, and what where we go with those questions is also uh, you know a closed-ended set of alternatives that need to be looked at, uh, generic in that sense. So thanks for that question, Donald. I think that's uh, that was a good one. And there's two other Anymore? questions. Yeah, there are two more questions. Let me let me jump. Let me answer them quickly myself, and then I'll let you finish it up for the last couple of minutes. So the first question is, what are the challenges in negotiating from staff log to managed services? And you know, this is the uh, this is the issue that I've been dealing with for years. The number one challenge that I see from the client side is not to do a head count. And you know, say we're moving to managed services. It's not a matter of counting how many people there are. It's a matter of defining the service levels that we have. That's always been the client challenge. The vendor challenge is how to reinforce that, how to be able to stand up and say, as a managed service, we're going to be held accountable to metrics and, and targets, not to the headcount. And those have always been the biggest challenges I've seen for that, that type of model. The second question, then I'll defer back to you, is on the IP during failing contracts. And it, it's, it could be a nightmare. I mean, it's a matter of having a good contract. And the, what I, the way I protect it is making sure that the vendor understands that if there is ever another opportunity for them to continue work with us as clients, 
um, they need to be able to preserve and confirm that they're meeting the service levels, the master service agreement, and all the contract terms and conditions. It's hard that if you terminate a client that you'll never use again uh, to be able to hold them accountable if, unless you want to start suing them depending on where they are. So it's always difficult, but I always try and do that and make sure they understand that by supporting the security of the IP and holding the contract um, terms and conditions, they'll they have a better chance of winning business in the future. Back to you. Hi everybody, this is Laurence again. I'm gonna. Um, looks like maybe Hamant was knocked out of the um, out of the session, but I just want to, on his behalf, on Tool's behalf, on everyone's behalf, thank you for joining us today, and um, thanks for joining us. Just a reminder: the recording will be shared in the next couple of days via email. I'll also uh, be sharing the PDF version of our presentation deck, so all the, uh, the great information will be, you know, easy to easily available and easy to share with your networks and contacts. So, thanks everybody one more time, and um, if you have any follow-up questions or anything like that, you can very easily reach out to us info at neogroup.com, specifically to Hamanth at Hamanth at neogroup.com, and um, once again, thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Yes, I was on mute, so thank you everybody, and I'm back here, and I'd love to hear from you. Thanks, and have a wonderful day.